peaks and the valleys, the divine weaving that has been her life from her South American indigenous roots of her native Guyana, the colorful land of the many waters, and bringing with her the rhythms of the Caribbean into daily living with heartfelt openness to the land of the free. Through Jennifer's healing ministry, through her music, poetry, storytelling, and dance, you may just catch her mother's wisdom sayings or a lyrical Caribbean song, sometimes with humor and other times with great poignancy, but certainly always with a heart towards the divine. Jennifer enthusiastically collects rocks and crystals, is an advocate for racial healing and immigration reform, and is the first mining engineer of South America. She holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in mining engineering from New Mexico Tech, as well as an undergraduate degree in mathematics. She works as an environmental scientist in Livermore, California, and is an ordained deacon in the Episcopal Church. When I spoke with Jennifer earlier today, she shared that she is opening her heart tonight so that others can see the gift we are each meant to bring to the world. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Jennifer Nelson. Thank you. Bamboo fire, what kind of fire? Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Bamboo fire, what kind of fire? Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Bamboo fire, hot, hot fire. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Bamboo fire, hot, hot fire. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Six o'clock and the pot not done yet. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Six o'clock and the pot not done yet. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Give me the water to out out the fire. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Give me the water to out out the fire. Bamboo fire, mexo, mexo. Bamboo, bamboo fire, mexo. So, bamboo, bamboo fire, mexo. Bamboo, bamboo fire, mexo. Bamboo, bamboo fire, mexo, 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 mexo. I grew up in a culture where we celebrated everything. From the birth of a child to the death of a loved one, we celebrated. We danced and we sang. This is not to say that we didn't have ex experiences in life's challenges, but we chose to turn our eyes from the darkness and follow the light. For in the light, we found hope and in the hope, we found joy, and in the joy, we found our future. And what would the future bring? And for those who have ears, listen. Listen in the space between my words for the call of the divine. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Nelson. I come from a land that is near the sea, famous for its muddy brown waters, where we sing songs about the land and the sea. Born in the land of the mighty Roraima, land of great rivers and far stretching seas. So like the mountain, the sea and the river, great wide and deep in our lives would we be. Onward, upward, may we ever go. 
Day by day in strength and beauty grow, till at length we each of us may show what Diana's sons and daughters can be. Songs about life and about death. We consider ourselves part British and we primarily speak English and yet we hear Portuguese and Spanish and Dutch and French spoken all around us with dishes such as oxtail pepper pot and cooked up rice, coconut rice, I mean, and curry chicken and curry fish. The vibrant colors of the many fruits from the yellow, orange, juicy mangoes to the purple star apples and the fragrance of the pink lady guavas awaken our senses. I grew up in a house located a few blocks from the ocean, such that I could hear the waves, the sound of the waves as I fell asleep. And I would wake to the clatter of the fishermen's wooden carts, the sound of the wheels against the gravel road. Clackety clack, clackety clack, clackety clack as they hurriedly push their carts, jostling each other to be among the first to arrive at market to sell their wares. Seafood fresh from the Atlantic Ocean. Even now, as I remember, I could feel and taste the salty air, the smell of the wind and heavy moisture of the cool sea air coursing through my nostrils and filling my lungs as I run to catch the carts to buy our share of red snapper and bangamary and shrimp before they pass our house. The day has dawned. Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. I say, who you can I be morning? Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. I say, keep your conniving morning. When you've been a corrupt, you now been tell me morning. Now because your money gone, you also for tell me morning. When you had your pocket full, you now been tell me morning. Now because your money gone, you go in for tell me morning. I say morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. I say, who you can I be morning? This is a great place for me to stop. I would like to let you into my culture by teaching you what we Guyanese call a kwekwe song, usually sung as part of a pre wedding ritual. But this particular song, like some others, could be sung at any time, a gift from my ancestors. So here goes my teaching moment. I'm gonna ask you to literally drop your jaws, drop your jaws like, oh. So when we go morning, you can get that sound. And you sopranos, you can get it too. I sing second soprano, believe me. If I can get it, you can do it. The thing is you drop your jaws and you're morning. Mm. Oh. And it's not morning. There are no G's and no R's here. It's morning. Morning neighbor, try this to me. Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. Morning neighbor, morning. I said, will you can I in morning? I'm gonna try it again. And I'm going to say it this time. And this time, I want you to really sit up. If you're sitting, look, I'm going to sit up too. Open up that diaphragm. And maybe you'll open up that fifth chakra while you're doing it. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. I said, were you conniving morning? 
Again, manin neba manin. Manin neba manin. Manin neba manin. I said, what you conniving manin? You sound great. Now let's sing it. I know you're muted, but you can sing it. You can hear yourself. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. I said, were you conniving morning? I bet you sound great. <laughs> you know, the point is, when you sing our songs, when you sing our Kwekwe songs, it's not about getting it right. It's about singing and opening your heart with wild abandon. That's what it's about. And that's what the guy needs. Tradition is all about. It's enjoying yourself because life, this life is too short. It's too short. You all sounded great. So the one neighbor, let me explain to you what I was singing. The one neighbor is wishing his neighbor Joe. And it usually starts, neighbor Joe, morning neighbor. Neighbor Joe, I just didn't sing that part. The one neighbor, neighbor Joe, is asking neighbor Joe. He says, he said, good morning. And neighbor Joe says to him, I am telling you good morning. I'm not saying good morning to you because you only tell me good morning when you need something. Now, because your money gone, you hustle to tell me morning. When you had your pocket full of money, oh, you know, no, I can't get a voice. Morning. But now because your money is gone, you're ready to tell me morning. And you know why? Because you probably want to borrow some money from me. <laughs> That's what that song is all about. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. Morning, neighbor, morning. I said, oh, you can I even morning. Thank you. Thank you for singing that with me. God, it took me back. It takes me back. And it's good. Now we're going to get serious. And I want to take you someplace really sacred. Yes, any time the moist tropical sun rises over the land of many waters, it is a good morning. And on those mornings, when I was lucky enough to stay overnight at my grandmother's house, how comforting it was to wake up in the morning, the early morning, to her soothing voice. Whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. God answers prayers in the morning. God answers prayers at noon. God answers prayers in the evening. So keep your heart in tune. Yes, I grew up in a home rich in culture and spirituality. So that even as a tomboy, when I announced that I wanted to attend St. Rose's High, it's a convent for girls. Not my mother, not my father, nor my five rambunctious brothers blinked an eye. My parents were teachers, and yet they could barely afford the numerous textbooks for, for their own children. I remember having to borrow most of my textbooks some nights just before an exam. I would have to wait until evening after my friends were finished with their studies to use their textbooks. And that was if I was lucky enough that they allowed me to use them. In fact, I can recall one friend, Lurleen, suggesting that I ask Desrin to lend me her textbook 
because see, she was finished for the evening. She was finished studying for that exam. However, Desrin asked me instead. She said, you know what? I'm not lending you my textbook. She said, just like how my mother could buy me a textbook, you need to have your mother buy you one. She had no idea that I couldn't afford it. Sometimes I went in cold in the exam. By cold, I mean only studying from my notes. This did not stop me. My mother strengthened our values through poetry and scripture and wisdom sayings. Strive for education before you are old. Education is better than silver or gold. Silver or gold may tarnish away, but a sound education will never decay. Pass it on, pass it on. Even in my thirst for education, there was this yearning to serve and to help others. Inside of me, there was a longing to help those like myself, those who didn't have, those who didn't have school clothes, those who didn't have textbooks, didn't have shoes, didn't have, didn't have. My school motto was serviam. I will serve. And for me, that was exemplified by my mother at home. I was already used to helping my mother care for our elderly neighbor and landlord, Daddy Jotham, who over the course of the years had become arthritic and he could barely pour the water into his jug. I learned to bring and to warm the water so my mother could care for him. Oh, wow. Well, I learned to, to, to help him in any way possible. I learned that that meant a whole bunch to Daddy Israel, Daddy Jotham. At about age 17, and just prior to my graduation, I found myself approaching Sister Hazel, the school principal, and the words just tumbled out. Sister Hazel, I said, I feel called to the convent. She reminded me that I wanted to study engineering and mathematics in college. And I still remember her very lovingly telling me, go out and experience the world and live your life. And if you are truly being called, God will not give up on that call. So I said, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. So, one second, I have a little bit of a thing here. Here we go. With Sister Anthony's blessings, and my family's blessings. I went off. I went off to, to try my hand at something. I didn't quite know what then, but I knew somewhere and somehow I had to succeed because I had the divine with me, before me, in front of me, behind me, beneath me, above me wrapping me in Christ's warmth, light, and love. One second. Oh. Somehow this went away. Hmm. 
I, here it comes, sorry. Hmm. No worries. And my mother used to, used to quote a poem. Thank you. My mother quoted a poem. Always, always scripture, poetry, always. It's called Persevere. Drive the nail a right, boys. Hit it on its head. Strike with all your might, boys, while the iron's red. When you've work to do, boys, do it with a will. They who reach the top, boys, come in. First, must climb the hill. Standing at the foot, boys, gazing at the sky. How can you get up, boys, if you never try? Though you stumble off, boys, do not be downcast. Try and try again, boys. You'll succeed at last. So I had that to go with. I took those words to heart and received not one, but two full scholarships. One in electrical engineering and the other in the unlikely field of mining engineering. The fact that I already had two older brothers studying electrical engineering and that I loved the outdoors and that I played in the dirt and the soil as a tomboy and that I loved rocks made my choice clear to me. However, not so fast. My mother was outraged that I would want to go into a field where there were no women. My dear child, are you out of your mind? She said when I told her of my choice. She was adamant that her daughter, whom she had sent to an all girls convent school was not going to work in any mine among dust laden coarse men. My mother's thoughts, not mine. Then my brothers prompted, promptly reminded her that she always taught us to reach for the stars and on the way down, you might just catch the moon. She was forced to capitulate and off I went to complete my one year internship working in the rugged open pit bauxite mines in Linden, Guyana. And in the, that mining industry was where I first encountered sexism, like it was the order of the day. After all, how dare I go to upset a good thing? No women were allowed in the mines except the cleaning staff, and even they got picked on. Thank God that I grew up with five male siblings because it sharpened my verbal skills to handle those men, some of whom felt that it was their job to make sure that I didn't succeed. Hmm. You mean you're getting two degrees in science? What are they doing, giving away degrees? I hear you're attempting to study mining engineering, said another, laughingly, suggestive, suggestively, by the way, I have a colleague coming in from the UK. Could you probably show him around Georgetown? What are you doing here? Is your daddy some big wig in the government that got you into this internship program? Are they planning on bringing other women here? If so, I'm prob it's probably time for me to leave. Why are you not in some man's kitchen? making his meals. <laughs> the boys are saying that you need to slow down. You're working too hard. You're making us look bad. Me not dead yet by a bada me bamba. Me not dead. Me not dead yet answer bite me I bamba. Me not dead. Dead. Death, not dead yet, death, death, me not dead yet, death, death, not dead yet, death, death, me not dead yet, me not dead yet, no, me not dead yet, I am not dead yet. The path ahead of me was to become a scientist, but not only that, 
See, the call from God was still reverberating in my heart. And I found myself at Grace Cathedral Episcopal Church in San Francisco as a volunteer at diocesan convention in the year 2015. And, I le and let me tell you what happened on that day of October 17th, 2015. We had just finished lunch and we were packing up when I felt this strong urge to run home as fast as I could. See, my mother was in, ho was in hospice care and I knew she would have wanted me to help a convention and I went to convention. And this feeling rose up in me that I needed to leave. I quickly told them I had to go and I took off as fast as my foot would carry me towards that train station, heading for home. As things would happen, when I was about 10 minutes from disembarking, the hospice nurse called to let me know that my mother had taken her last breath. I can't tell you how I made it home from there on. I only know that I did. In time to close my mother's eyes, caress her face, and kiss her for the last time. The previous evening, I sang all my mother's favorite hymns as I held her face and thanked her for the sacrifices she had made for all of us. And I reminded her of how much I loved her. I felt that God had placed me there like a doula to birth my mother back to the creator. And she would have said, if she could, it was some home going. When peace like a river descended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, it has caused me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Less than a year later, while undergoing my chaplaincy training, I found myself at the hospital bedside of a retired psychiatrist. It was funny because I was a newbie, but somehow he wanted me. He sent away the people that were experienced. See, ministers are often called upon to hear the private thoughts of the dying because often the dying want to protect their family members from hearing their real feelings. And unfortunately, we ministers have oftentimes witnessed the deep isolation at one of the most profound times in a person's life. One evening, he took me into his confidence. If I could only die with little or no pain, I'd be happy to leave this world right this minute, he said. However, my wife would not let me go. He explained that he had already made the necessary arrangements for his family members to live comfortably after he has gone, but that they were fighting to, too hard to keep him alive. As he put it, in the horrible pain he was experiencing, it pained my heart to watch him, watch him with his wife. At one point she asked, he asked her to leave the room so that he and I could have a private conversation and she obliged. And as we shared stories, I told him how I sang for my mother that memorable evening 
the day before she left this world as we know it. So this is for my psychiatrist friend. I am sending you light to hold you, to heal you. I'm sending you light to hold you in love. I am sending you light to hold you, to heal you. I'm sending you light to hold you in love. And about a year later, after my ordination, I remembered that gentleman and I remembered my mother. Then I remembered the moment that I had felt the call return. I approached my mother to tell her that this yearning to help the underserved had returned. And she confessed that she had a story to tell me. See, I was apologizing because, because even though I was a scientist, it wasn't enough. There were other things I needed to do. She confessed that when she was younger and she began having children, Every time she had a baby, it was a boy. Every time she had a baby, yet another boy. Five to be exact. So she and her evangelist friend went into a church. And instead of asking, her request was, dear God, if you give me a girl, I will let her live for you. She said she was reluctant to share this with me because she didn't want to bias my choices, my life's choices. Then I remembered going to both of my sons, one of whom is here tonight, to tell them about my discernment, to which this one that's right here replied in, He said, mom, it looks like you're the last to know. <laughs> Give me a clean heart so I may serve you. Lord, fix my heart so that I may be used by you. For I'm not worthy of all these blessings. Give me a clean heart and I'll follow thee. I'm not asking for the riches of the land. I'm not asking for someone to know my name. Give me a clean heart, a clean heart, so I will follow thee. Give me a clean heart, a clean heart, so I will follow And you know, in my heart, I felt an invitation to follow the divine the moment I witnessed the lynching of George Floyd. It struck a chord of terror in my body as I feared the same for my two grown sons. And I was horrified to learn that our federal government has refused to legislate anti-lynching laws. Do you realize that Congress has been pre presented with anti-lynching legislation over and over for the last 
200 years. And in 200 years, this Congress has refused to pass anti-lynching legislation. A phone call came to me out of the blue where I was asked, would I be willing? Would I be willing to sponsor anti-lynching legislation right in my own diocese, the diocese of California? By this time, I was beyond angry. I realized I had to do something. I had to do something for my sons. I had to do something for my brothers. I had to do something for my brothers and sisters. My brown and black brothers and sisters. My white brothers and sisters. I had to do something. I had just finished reading a sermon by well-known professor and playwright, Anna DeVere Smith, who preached at Grace Cathedral on Trinity Sunday, get this, seven days after George Floyd's death, where she asked, what is our role? What is the role of the church? A yes rose up in my heart and everything in me said yes. I finally felt like I was doing something. I had found something to do. And I found myself standing before all of convention, weeping as I told them how my heart broke. When I saw my son wearing a bandana for a mask on March 17th, before masks were out or given out, and he looked to me, like a thug, <laughs> and I was his own mother. I cried, I cried. I cried because even the racism had seeped deep in my heart. I cried. My son was simply going to do some grocery shopping for me. And I cried, oh, I cried. I asked him to take off the bandana. I experienced one of those moments my Baptist friend would call nothing but God. When I was working on writing anti-racism legislation for the Episcopal Diocese of California, I was invited by a very good friend to attend a Healing the Racial Divide seminar series at your very own Barbara Brennan School of Healing. And I was amazed at just how much the sharing and teaching in that six week event would be instrumental in helping me to put together my resolution. I took notes. I took notes. I have a whole book of notes. I took notes from Patricia. I took notes from Haruna. I took notes from Kathy. I took notes from Ladine. You don't know I know your names. I took notes from Elder Ada. And when she mentioned a particular name, I knew I was in the right place. I took notes. I took notes like my life depended on it. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? And I was amazed, totally amazed at how it all came together because I was at that particular, those events, six weeks, I took off vacation time, whatever time I needed to. I don't understand how or why, but I just had to be there and I was there. I remember 
when Haruna shared, I couldn't write fast enough because I wanted to share it with my sons. I needed to share that with my sons. Boy, did I take notes. And as I presented my resolution, I wept. I wept before hundreds of colleagues to somehow of delegates, my colleagues and congregants in my diocese. I so badly wanted my white colleagues to somehow understand what I have to go through, what black and brown people have to go through every day as a living terror of daily life. Do you know how much it means to know that my white bishop and my diocese are in solidarity with me, a brown woman? Do you realize? Do you realize how deeply touched I was when my colleagues responded by passing the support for the Emmett Till anti-lynching resolution? <laughs> and do you know that it passed unanimously. And once more, I couldn't hold back the tears. Yes, I wept. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Oh, Master Grant, that I may never see. So much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. But people, that peace was not coming to us soon enough. The death of George Floyd in May of last year reminded me of Armad Arbery a 25 year old young man, much like my two sons. He was killed near his home in Brunswick, Georgia. See, two men chased after him as he was out jogging on February 23rd of last year. He is one of literally thousands of black people, black people who have been lynched in a place where people feel like they have the right to do it. And you know, the most disturbing part of it is that people feel the support of their community. So people feel they can get away with it. Clergy people, women and men, and even children lynched because of the color of their skin. I would like to share a story with you, a story about a woman who was also from Brunswick, Georgia, and her name was Anna Ellison Butler Alexander. She was a woman whose birthday is attributed to January 1st, 1863. And the reason I say attributed is because that was the date of the Declaration of Emancipation to free the slaves. We don't even know her real birth date. And that means that she was actually born into slavery before there were any birth records for slaves. In fact, Anna was born during the time of the emancipation on an island off of Georgia called Butler Island. Hence her name. They took the names of the slave owners. Her dad was the head slave of the household for their so-called master. And as you know, slaves were not allowed to read or to even be taught how to read. 
but a woman, a kind woman, a white woman came along. Her name was Fanny Gemble. She happened to marry the owner of that plantation and at the risk of their lives, hers and Anna's father, she taught Anna's dad how to read. After the emancipation, Anna's dad moved his family and 11 children to Brunswick, Brunswick, Georgia. Yes, the same Brunswick, Georgia, to that very place where now a hundred years later, armored arbory was shot down. Anna sewed and taught and did odd jobs and gathered together enough money to create a schoolhouse for her children, for the children that she would teach after the emancipation. She taught them to read, she taught them to write. And as they grew, she taught them college prep courses. She even escorted them to the historically black colleges. Because there was so much segregation in the South, they didn't want blacks in their colleges. So others created an education. It was like a parallel education system, you would say. On Sundays, that schoolhouse was used for church. In fact, it is now known as and was known as the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd, which 125 years later still has members in it today. Back in those days, the Episcopal Church was segregated. See, there was a white convention and a black convention, but the white bishop taught so much of Anna that he consecrated her at a black convention as the first deaconess in the entire Episcopal Church. He consecrated her because she was of service to her community and taught children who would normally never know how to read. Without Anna, these descendants of former slaves wouldn't stand a chance in normal society. How many times did Anna wonder? Wonder when one of her kids who had walked away whatever returned to her? How many times did she fear for their safety because of the color of their skin? And how many times did the children she taught to be grow up to be teens and adults only to have their lives cut short by yet another lynch mob? How many times? How many times? Even now, 125 years later, the people of that church still fear for their lives. And I tell you this because I have been present and watched them. Well, I did, but yeah, watched them, so listened, and you could hear the fear. And they're older people. What is also significant about the interweaving of these two stories? is that I was the homilist at an event held at St. Anna's Episcopal Church in Antioch, California on October 20, 10th, 2019, whereby Anna Ellison Butler Alexander, for whom the church was newly named, was being honored. Because she supplied the textbooks when there were no textbooks. Remember my story because she supplied the clothes when there were no clothes for them to wear to school, because she supplied the shoes when they didn't have any. I would have been one of her students, easily. Hmm? And she was known as the saint in the Episcopal church. She has become my saint. See, I call upon her for her strength. As Kathy Bauer says, Saint Anna, show us the way. You can't stop the spirit. She goes on and on. She is like a mountain, old and strong. You can't stop the spirit. She goes 
on and on she is like a mountain old and strong. I'd like you to sing that with me. It's simple, a little bit of staccato, but it's there and you can do it. You can stop the spirit, she goes on and on, she is like a mountain old and strong. You can't stop the spirit, she goes on and on, she is like a mountain old and strong. In what way? is the divine whispering to you and you and you and you. And how are you hearing that call? So now you have so patiently listened to my story. What is the divine inviting in you and who shall God send? Amen. I will take any questions that you may have at this time. I have a question, uh, Reverend Jennifer. Uh, you've you've done such uh, deeply important work with the anti-lynching resolutions, and I know that spirit's still moving through you. And I'm so curious what your next steps are on your journey. Well, I'm looking at. There's some other resolutions out there, legislation that we're looking at. And one of them has to do with policing, policing and finding a way to restructure the police, finding a way to make it so that there isn't to, to, to reduce the violence in the police force. I'm also working on with some high school kids this time who feel that police on their campus is not needed, who feel that resource officers should not be armed. It terrorizes, it traumatizes minority students to see people with guns walking around their school. There has to be a better way. I'm also working on affordable housing in the Bay Area. I'm looking at, I'm working with a group called Genesis and we're looking to see how we can urge, strongly urge the, um, the different cities, Pleasanton and Livermore and Dublin and Alameda County and other counties in California to create more housing and more affordable housing so that the people who serve here in those areas and serve in your cities don't have to drive long distances to get home and to get back to work. And as an environmental scientist, it's a big deal for me because it reduces the pollution. It's a big deal. Those are some of the, I'm working on immigration reform. There's a story I didn't tell and it was okay. It was about my brother not being able to come for my mother's funeral 
because they did not give him a visa in time. We need to be mindful. These are people too. My mother waited. She waited for him. She hadn't seen him in over 30 years. 30 years. And they still, they gave him the visa after she died. So I'm working with immigration reform, even before then, but that really made me understand because then I, 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 I experienced it myself. And Kathy, I think one of the things I've learned, you're so welcome. When you've gone through this stuff, I think God opens up your heart even more to love and to empathize and to give because you understand, you understand. It's not for me, but it's for all of us. You're so welcome, Evelyn. Yeah, for all of us. So my question to you is, what is God inviting? All of you, all of you. See, we all have gifts. The creator gave us gifts, all of us. What are your gifts? And how are you using them? How are you using them? I have this, this, this recurring dream. Yes, I'm sure it was too. I have this recurring dream that I, that I wake up and God says to me, I gave you all these gifts and what have you done for my people? What have you done for my people? So I have to do something. I have to do something. I keep saying something in my little corner. Doesn't have to be a lot. And I like to tell Kathy, just perturbate the system. You perturbate the system. That means you trouble the system. Good trouble. As, John, as con late Congressman John Lewis would say, just good trouble. But don't sit on the sidelines, I urge you. You don't have to get up and protest in the streets. There are different ways. There are different ways. There are legislation you can get behind. And by the way, the anti-lynching resolution on the day that it was sent to, um, she was, elect president, vice president elect at the time, Kamala Harris, was the day that she knew that they had won that election and she was going to be the vice president. It was sent also to Diane Feinstein and she has already responded. See, I'm taking it to the, the Episcopal church in the whole of the United States. And I want the Episcopal Church to say to other churches, we cannot sit back and let another 200 years pass before something is done. We got to do something now. Something, just get behind somebody that's doing something. You don't have to do a lot, just a little bit in your small corner. That's what I aim to do, just in my small corner. Don't care to be out there. My son always says, mom, you always don't care to be out there. Just my little bit in my small corner. Perturbate the system. That's what I say. But I thank each and every one of you, especially BDSH. You don't know how much you affected 
the success of our resolution. You don't know. I thank you. I thank you. And Jenny, our yes, reverend, reverend Jennifer, I must say how much I appreciate what you're doing. And you're saying it's in your little corner, but it sounds like a very big deal to me. <laughs> I, I hope that you continue to have more success. I'm in a little corner too, that I am bringing awareness to the people in my little corner. Amen. But um, nothing at the level that, that you're doing. We have a lot of um, Zoom meeting at this time with COVID. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people aren't really in tune with what is going on. They have yeah. their separate um, knowledge of how they see things. And I'm just trying to educate in some little way that I can. I'm like a sponge. I just pick up every anything I can learn on what I'm doing. Every little thing is like, you know, I can't get enough. I can't get enough. And that's when you know it can't be just from you. You know? It's a have a whole book. It's it's really a revelation. Yes, it really is. That's why I call it it's the call of the divine. It's the invitation of the divine. And I tried to show you all how things came together for me. That it seems as though my life is this tapestry and many people are in there walking their own paths, but we cross paths at times. And so interwoven in my tapestry are all these beautiful threads of people's lives, other people's lives. And I know it makes a great pattern, I can't see it but I know it's a good pattern. Yeah. Nothing is happenstance. Nothing. Yeah. But there's hope. Amen. Always. There's hope. Always hope. Yeah. Always hope. Thanks, Earlene, for doing your little part because it's each of us doing our own. Thank you, Doreen. That's the name of one of my cousins. She loved the folk songs, the folk music. Thank you. The Kwekwe songs. Reverend Nelson, Reverend Nelson. My son, how may I help you? Yeah, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you, you know, for everything, for the example that you set between you and that lady over there, my favorite auntie. Y'all give me so much to strive for and, and give me such a great example. I, I can't thank you enough. I'm so proud of you right now. Um, I got to echo her sentiments about you minimizing your efforts and us playing our role in making sure that you don't forget or under, you know, let anything go underappreciated in regards to what you're doing. You know, you're a star in your own right, and you don't bring in names like Diane Feinstein in small corners. So, Continue doing what you're doing and continue to push this line. Thank you. And thank you for your help in getting that resolution out because you did your own little part. See, my family helped. Trust me. He had a cadre of lawyer friends who did their little piece. It's all right. She, she thank you. With a, with a beautiful touch to it, the eloquence and the grace. I'm a little more rough with mine, but <laughs> to the same end to the same end. So, and thank you again for uh, for invoking the name of Kathleen Nelson and keeping her spirit alive and around. Thank and you, my son. My eye over here. But y'all know, you know what, what you and her mean to me. You know, ladies in my life mean a whole lot. So I needed that. I love you. Love you. Thank you. I love you too. Love you, Danae. Thank you. That's my family, you guys. Yeah, thank you. 
I would just like to um, say that I really, really appreciate all that you're doing because we, in my age, we pass the baton, but we pass it and we still hold on and pray and uh, encourage. So I think you are doing mighty work, God's work. And when you're doing God's work, you're always under his covenant and whatever you touch will manifest because it's for God. So I am really just so grateful that you have taken this seriously. See, I have sons and grandsons and great grandsons, and I know that we women have always gone before pushing and challenging. And we are there because we are protecting and looking out for our sons because there is a spirit that wants to take black men out. Okay. And we go before because we realize that and without them, we won't have little black children. So we have to, and I am just happy to see you going forth doing all that you can because we have to. So our offspring, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have a place of peace. So thank you. Thank you, Elder Ada. You're welcome, Mylan. Cousin Jennifer. Hello, my cousin Sandra. It sounds like Sandra. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on what you're doing. And I have a vision. I could see you being a congresswoman for oh, Lord. California in a couple of years. Whoa. Wow. I think you can do it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We do, oh. we do need people like you to push these things for us. Yeah. Because this has been going on way too long. I agree. Totally agree. I think you'd yeah. be the right person for California. I'll start working on it. Oh, Lord. <laughs> he will, too. You're welcome, Shirley and Carolyn. You're welcome. Oh, wow. I already got people voting for me and I haven't even <laughs> Look what you're doing. Oh, Lord. Thank you. It's just a pleasure to be able to share this work and to share what I've been doing and to share how God has so um, touched my life. And like I said, it started so small. And you know I grew up with you, Sandra. So you know. Yeah. We grew up together. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to each and every one of you for just listening. For listening. Hopefully for listening how God is impacting your life how the divine essence is flowing through you. Thank you. Look what you started. I got votes and I haven't even. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you. Every one of you, thank you but it's each of us doing our own little bit. That's what makes the difference. 
As Catherine, as the, um, Anna Devere Smith says. Mm. Thank you, Tish. We have to stop standing on the sidelines and watching the parade go by. We have to get in it. And it doesn't take much. Mm. Doesn't take much. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Rita. And it's funny, when God takes a hold of you, you can't help it. <laughs> you got to go where the spirits and the spirit says go. There's a song that says, I'm going to sing when the spirit says sing. I'm going to sing when the spirit says sing. I got to sing when the spirit says sing. And obey the spirit of the Lord. Obey. Obey, obey, obey. I'm gonna shout when the spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the spirit says shout. I'm gonna shout when the spirit says shout. And obey the spirit of the Lord. Obey, 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 obey. I'm gonna sing when the spirit says sing. You gotta sing. Mm. Mm. You got to sing. So find your own little way to do your part. Mm. I think it was Malcolm MLK Jr. who said, that all it takes for evil to take over is for one good person to sit by and do nothing. Just have to do something. Good trouble. Good trouble. Jennifer, I have a question for you. Go right ahead. How would you speak to someone like me who's a, a white woman how, how would I be able to contribute? I would ally with you. I would find your strengths and utilize them to the best of my ability. So if you are part of, of legislation, if you're part of whatever group that I could utilize, that's what I would do. I would ally with you. Thank you. Uh, just, you know, for me, it feels like it's a personal process issue. And it is. You know, and understanding how I perceive other people. Yes, and, and it and, is. And being willing to own that. Mm -hmm. And that being uh, not just part of allyship, but being a, a true, authentic uh, mm -hmm. willingness to change. Amen. But it takes us being able to sit down to the table and listen to each other. And like you said, bring our authentic selves and open our hearts and meet each other. It doesn't have to be halfway, but just meet each other, meet somewhere in the middle. So we can begin the dialogue and to begin the healing process. But the first, begin the internal process of figuring out where we are and where our biases are and working with those. Thank you, Jill. somebody speaking yes it's me um there was a request in the chat box well they were wondering if they might be able to get your contact information so that they could contribute to your efforts would it Thank be okay you. if i shared any of your contact info would it be okay if i shared your email address you may yes okay. kathy thank you through kathy i'll put it in the chat box tonight right thank now. you thank you so much
Thank you, all of you, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And again, thank you, Kathy, for asking me to share my, my journey with so many wonderful, beautiful souls, beautiful people. Thank you. I feel your hearts all opened, opened, whoa. Light, light just flowing. Mm. Mm. Thank you. So who's playing you in the movie? Pardon me? <laughs> My son. <laughs> Were you picking the star you in the movie? Oh. Oh, just sharing, just sharing, my son. Just planting seeds. I hear you. Oh, Lord. Jill, we got work to do. <laughs> I see how this empowerment runs through your family and it goes both directions. That is so beautiful. He pushes me. He really does. Wonderful. I'm still waiting for a book. It's coming. I was just taking a little bit of time to get your email address in there, but it is now in there for those who would like to be in touch with Reverend Jennifer Nelson. Thank you. I would really like to take this moment to thank you from the bottom of my heart reverend jennifer nelson for just your beingness you are a force of nature you're a force of spirit you're a force of love and you shine so bright and i'm just so deeply deeply grateful to um be among your orbit <laughs> here on earth. <laughs> and I also want to thank your beautiful family for being here. We can feel the weight, the weaving of that beautiful tapestry because of your willingness to show up and share your voices. And we can see how the light is distributed through your family and through um, Jennifer's mother, as she was evoked here tonight. So we send your mother blessings tonight and much gratitude and your father, much gratitude for bringing us you in all of who you are. Just thank you. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. Mm. Have a good night, all of you. Blessings to you. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.